1637, philosopher Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Today, with the influence of technology, I submit to you all that we say, we are linked, therefore we are. Social media, news outlets, and blogs have become a large part of our digital identities. If it happened, we could find it. And if we can't find it, do you even believe that it really happened? You don't need me to tell you it's a digital world out there. But because how everything is changing so quickly, it's easy to forget how far we've came and how fast. And also the way that we, human beings, haven't changed. As a child, I can remember sneaking into my dad's office to use his computer. It was an IBM with an Intel 8086, and this thing was styling. <laughs> it was beige and off-white and more beige, but it had a turbo button. And every time I sat down, I would press it and I would floor it. 10 megahertz, just cruising. Getting everyone I love killed in Oregon Trail. Everybody's getting dysentery. Like, side note, that is a dark game, really. But I loved it, and I wanted one. I didn't exactly need one at the, at the age of six or so, but I wanted one. So I asked, and I asked, and I asked, and I begged. However, when I was in the seventh grade, my dad caved. And he told me I could have one, but only if I could build it. So, challenge accepted. Little Eric went into full-on nerd mode. I started researching the parts that I needed, the case that I wanted, the monitor, everything. I was all in. And this thing was going to be beige <laughs> with a monitor that was also beige, but it was going to have a little green on the front panel because, you know, I was a cool kid back in the day, and I had a style on him a little bit. So anyway, my dad saved up. We bought the parts, and I built my first computer. Maxed out, 450 megahertz Intel processor, 800 megabyte hard drive, 64 megabytes of RAM. I was rolling. Like, <laughs> could you imagine buying that, spending money on something like that today? We have toasters with more power than that today. <laughs> but I, I was in heaven, and, and I loved it. But what hasn't changed is that I still love computers, technology, and the way we interact with it. Today, I'm a cyber psychologist with a focus on information and human safety. Basically, I analyze the impact technology has on us as people regarding digital social engineering. Because we, as people, were curious. We agree, then we disagree, then we disagree some more, and then we argue. However, our strength in our humanity is that we question everything. As a child, a thousand times you asked why. And as an adult, a million times more, we've asked why not. We question the reasoning to our existence, and we wondered what happens after. Our curiosity has taken us to the deepest parts of the ocean and far into space. And although we have yet to set foot on another planet, I submit to you all today that we've created one. Right in front of our faces, literally. Our phones, tablets, laptops, and computers take us to a new and connected, connected environment. One in which distance is not existent, where everyone and everything is accessible in an instant. This world has the planet's body of knowledge, entertainment, and social network. A world in which everything and anyone can be anything or anyone. You can show your highlights and nothing more. You can show your achievements and omit your misfortunes. This is not natural for us. This is not an environment we were built for, nor one we discovered or created. This is one in which we are struggling to live in. Deep fakes, phishing, hacking, ransomware, all have taken beauty and added an unhealthy dose of reality. Online, anything could be faked, so attribution to a single person or a single place is nearly impossible, so the criminals get away free. 
We know the world we are building, but we haven't fully grasped the way that it impacts us and how we live. We might want to blame it on the machines, but the problem with doing that is, it's not the machines that are to blame. 74% of all data breaches involve the human element. We are the wild variable in the networks. We are the spirits driving the machine. And we live in the days where information is power and disinformation is control. And we cannot live on other planets due to a lack of water, oxygen, and food sources. And what we are finding is that we're struggling to live in this new world due to a lack of humanity and connection. What makes us feel connected and safe physically does not occur digitally, but in the most human way possible. We press on and we move forward, despite an overwhelming need for caution. Because in this environment, we have psychological vulnerabilities in fear, comfort, carelessness, and helpfulness, much like we do in the world that we know. And online, there are clear benefits for attackers to use technology. They can be more persistent. They can be anonymous. They can manage large amounts of data. They can target millions of people in seconds. They can go where humans cannot go. But also, they can use the modalities of influence to manipulate human behavior. The methods to influence human behavior remain the same whether we are online or face-to-face. -face. Just because the environment changes, we, people, stay exactly the same. And these principles are reciprocity. You do something for me, I will feel obligated to pay you back. For example, when you go out to eat, they may give you a mint on top of your bill because you are likely to tip 20% more because they did so. Also, when you go to a car dealership, they may offer you water, coffee, or popcorn because you are more likely to buy a car because they did so. Next, authority. Then commitment and consistency. Then scarcity. Then social proofing. And finally, liking. If I like you, you'll influence my behavior. For example, I am a huge Will Smith fan. Yes, before and after he smacked Chris Rock, it changed my mind not a bit. Because in my mind, he's the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He will always be the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. So if I saw him, I'd probably smile, laugh, do the Carlton dance, shake his hand. You know, I'm not doing that for everyone. I'm doing that because I like him. And because I like him, he influences my behavior. And in turn, I'll influence his behavior. None of this changes when you're online. You are still human. Your brain faces the same confusion, although you cannot see, hear, or verify who you're talking to. What we attempt to do, I like to call human factor authentication. You read a name or you see a face, then you begin to feel. When you see a name of a loved one, you begin to feel something and then you internalize their message. You internalize their message in their voice and in their tone if you know them enough. We authenticate the messenger before we accept the message. If you've ever read a book and then hated the movie, it's very similar to that. It's because you created that character in your mind with a voice and a look that's acceptable in your mind. So when you see and hear something different, it seems off-putting and you don't like it. But when everything could be faked, this becomes a problem. When the name you read doesn't match the key person behind the keyboard, you cannot tell a difference. This is something we all face. People of all ages, races, and genders have been victimized, so I wanted to throw all of that out and study us as a population of humans. I wanted to understand cyber victims. Back in my career, I spent a good portion of my career creating social engineering campaigns and phishing campaigns for companies, but I've also spent a significant amount of time conducting interviews because I wanted to understand what made people click, literally. And after I analyzed hundreds of interviews, what I found was that 
we have about six major personality traits for cyber victims. Let me preface, none of these are bad. And none of these make you a bad person. But number one, extroversion. Two, agreeableness. Then conscientiousness. Then openness to new experiences. Then impulsiveness. And finally, emotional stability. Being emotionally stable is not a bad thing. Of course, it is a very, very good thing. But if you've ever dealt with a friend or a person that is not emotionally stable at that moment in time, you know how hard it is to get them to do anything that makes sense. Another example, if you have a friend that is going through a harsh breakup, you may want to solve their problems like I solve my problems, and that's with some food. So you may want to take them out to eat for, let's say, sushi. He's like, hey, man, let's go out for sushi. And they break down in tears. They're like, oh my god, Sheila loves sushi. <laughs> tears going everywhere, snot flowing everywhere. And you just left there standing like, bruh, come on. Dude, please work with me here. Criminals think the same way. They don't want your story. They just want you to click. They just want your financial information, your social security number, and for you to click. That is all. So now, in the days of AI, we must ask the question, what happens when we make machines more human-like? What happens when you give a machine a name like Siri, Bard, or Alexa? What happens when the machine answers to that name? And what happens when those machines personify themselves by using the word I? And if we think Therefore, we are. If your computer thinks, what does it become? What we found is that when machines become human-like, we struggle to tell the difference between a machine and a human. Until recently, attackers could rely on anonymity to conduct their attacks. But now attackers can use artificially generated visuals and audio to make you see what they want you to see or make you hear what they want you to hear in the tone they want you to hear it or in a tone they know will cause you to react. Attackers can target people in a much more intimate manner. The impact of this can change technology and cybersecurity forever. The 74% of data breaches involving the human element could easily reach 80 or 90%. Let me tell you how. Recently, I set off to explore how does the human brain process and interpret artificially generated images. What we did, we conducted two experiments, one using behavioral testing and the other using neural imaging techniques. What we performed, we asked we flash images up of people, and we asked the participants to identify them as real or AI. What we found was that the human brain could recognize artificially generated faces about 52% of the time, while verbal identification accuracy was only 39%. Furthermore, the results worsened when we allowed photography filters like those from Instagram. With filters, the human brain could recognize an artificially generated face 41% of the time, while verbal identification accuracy was only 27%. What we concluded was that you may detect AI, but your behavior may not consistently indicate that you are seeing AI. When we face cybercrime, it doesn't physically feel the same as a, as a physical attack. But mentally and emotionally, it does. Emotional-based cyber attacks can still cause amygdala hijacking. What amygdala hijacking is, it's an emotional response that is immediate and overwhelming. This can occur by a significant emotional threat. And so when this happens, you stop thinking and you just start doing things. This is a fight or flight response. Example? I was not what you would call an honor student in grade school. No, I built a computer, grades weren't all that. However, when my report card came in, I can clearly remember my mom saying, 
these infamous words. You may have heard them as well. Wait until your dad sees this. <laughs> and you know what I would do? I would start panicking. I'd start cleaning, doing the dishes. I might go up to my mom, tap her on the leg, like, hey, mama, mama, mama. You know I love you, right? You know, I'm just trying to <laughs> fix it. Of course, none of that worked because none of that had anything to do with my grades. But I just stopped thinking, and I just started doing things. People do the same thing when they face cybercrime. The slight panic you feel when you see your manager's name. The overwhelming anxiety you feel when you see a message from a bill collector. The overwhelming feeling of love and excitement when you see a name of a loved one. All of these emotions can, will, and have been used against us by attackers. Imagine if you can actually see or hear a loved one asking you for a request. Or imagine if you can be scared for your job and you can actually see or hear your manager asking you to open the invoice attachment in the email. This is our reality. Attackers could still be anonymous, but selectively visible, posing as whomever they choose. So yes, people, us, we are the most vulnerable part of our networks. This is true. But people are also our best solution. When we say it's not a matter of if, but when there are cyber attacks, we are taking the possibility of safety away from us. People are the answer. Cybersecurity is a decision-based and psychology-based science because most hackers don't hack in, they log in. And truthfully speaking, security doesn't exist. Only acceptable levels of insecurity does. Because everything, everything has a risk. So we should not think about how. We should think about our execution. And we should not think about now. We should think about our evolution because our future depends on it. Thank you.